All right. Hello. I did something really amazing last weekend and it's been on my mind ever since. I went to my first festival ever, which in mid twenties, you would think that I would already have been to a festival. I had not and it was amazing. You know, I always thought Coachella would be one of those things where it was just like a really fun people watching spot for influencers, but I forgot that it was actually like a full fledged festival with like stages everywhere and music going on and the production of every single stage was like mind blowing. Yes, there are a lot of people walking around taking photos in their cute outfits, but overall, like the actual like music production and the show of it completely took my breath away, like completely. And also the amount of incredible acts that you're able to see all in one weekend. Because it was my first festival, I'm not super clear on like logistically what looks good from a festival and what doesn't, but the people that I was there with, they were like, dude, you're so spoiled for your first festival experience because it's not normally this well run. Between never having to wait that long for a bathroom line to having water stations everywhere, trash cans everywhere, and there's so much space. Like they, they sell out these tickets and yet you still, it's quite packed, but it's also you just have so much room to move around and walk around and dance. Honestly, Coachella was 10 out of 10. I was also a little spoiled because we got to go in the artist camping, humble brag but I'm in LA now, you know? And I just kept thinking to myself throughout the festival, I was like, how the f do you start a music festival? I mean, there's so much that goes into it. So many skills that you have to acquire over time. Like you can't just decide to make a festival. Well, some people do and they do not end up well. <laughs> You can't, for the most part, just decide to make a festival without loads of experience. Also, what came into my head was, let me research and make a video on my YouTube channel, which is why I love this YouTube channel so much. It's so nice being able to chat with you and do loads of research myself and just like learn about so many things that I probably wouldn't like look as deeply into if it wasn't for this channel. And it's so awesome being able to get on here and have these discussions about the ways so many different companies were formed. I think oftentimes we focus on this channel on physical products. And so I'm really stoked today to tell you the story about Coachella and how it came about. One thing I will say before I get started was that in doing all of my research, there was one documentary that I loved, which was actually made by YouTube. Um, it's a YouTube original about Coachella and the history of it. It goes out all the way up until 2019. It was so good. And if you're interested in learning more, because obviously I give you the 20 minute version. If you want the three hour version, go watch this documentary. It's so good, highly recommend it. And obviously they're able to put in a lot more of the performances and stuff. Let's get to the story of Coachella and how Paul Tolette and Rick Van Santen created it in 1999. Coachella takes place in the Empire Polo Club in Indio, California, located in the Coachella Valley, which is why it's called Coachella. But the funny fact is, when they decided originally to name it Coachella, no one liked the name. They were like, please do not name it Coachella. That's such an ugly name. They went forward with it anyway, and thus now we know it as the iconic Coachella. As I mentioned, it was founded by Rick Van Santen and Paul Tolette, but they are part of Golden Voice, who is the booking and promoting company that ended up making Coachella. Like I said, you can't just look at that 1999 moment of them starting Coachella. There's about 20 years of history that we've got to go through first. And I promise you, I'm only keeping in the very like relevant stuff to the starting of Coachella. We're gonna run through it fast, but they did start 1980. So 19 years before Coachella actually came to fruition. In 1980, there was this guy named Gary Tovar and he was obsessed with the punk music industry. And, and back then it was the early days of punk. So no venues wanted to book them. Law enforcement was always keeping their eye out for them. And it was just really hard to find spaces to gather. You know, we all know the way that like punk shows go. There are things that get broken. The crowd can get quite rowdy, but that's part of the beauty of it. So Gary Tovar took it as his own mission to find them places where they could gather and have these shows, no matter where he could find a book. And he's doing this for a while and because he's 
so good at it, it starts turning into a full-fledged business. He decides to name it Golden Voice since he now needs a business name. Right after that, he meets Paul Tolette. And Paul Tolette is booking shows himself as well, just bespoke events, whether it be at a warehouse or a pizza parlor. They meet and Paul Tolette ends up being the president of Golden Voice. Then around 1985, Paul Tolette and Gary Tavar meet Rick Van Santen. And Rick Van Santen and Paul Tolette end up becoming co-presidents of Gary Tovar's golden voice. At the beginning, they said that it was honestly like five people in an office just booking shows constantly and promoting them because there was so much to go around. They were booking sh like extremely small shows or they were also booking like a little bit larger shows of like early Red Hot Chili Peppers or something. As we go through the 80s then to the early 90s, alt rock starts coming up. And so they're booking shows for like early days of Nirvana and, and people like them. They were always struggling financially, but they just kept going with it because they were so passionate about what they were doing. Gary Tovar, the owner, he made most of his money on the side selling weed. What happened in 1991 is he actually ends up getting caught and put in jail. And now Golden Voice is run solely by Paul Tolette and Rick Van Santen because Gary Tovar kind of has to take his name out of it. Oh, hi. Uh, yes. Oh, oh my God. Hi. Ooh. Good morning. Good morning. This is Taro. Taro, say hi. Say hi. You don't get 100% of the cuddles that you don't ask for. I need to keep filming, okay? As I mentioned, it's just Paul Sola and Rick Van Santen doing Golden Voice. In 1993, this is when the history of Golden Voice starts really taking its shape towards Coachella. Pearl Jam really wants to throw a large concert, but they're really upset with Ticketmaster because Ticketmaster at that time kind of has a monopoly over all of the big stadiums in America and they're not the best company, they're price gouging customers and Pearl Jam is just not about it and, and really not okay with what they're doing. They go to Golden Voice and they're like, hi, we need to put on a really big concert anywhere you can find. The project is yours if you want it, but just help us find a space to hold a really massive concert. And Golden Voice is like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do. They start scoping out and they end up finding the Empire Polo Club in Indio, California. Basically this massive lush green field like so big and then it's all desert all around and mountains it's gorgeous so beautiful they bring the idea back to Pearl Jam and they're like we can throw a stage up here and if people are willing to drive two hours we've got a show for you Pearl Jam says yes amazing let's do it it's super low budget but people have such an amazing time they just loved putting this on, but you know, it's it's not a normal occurrence for their company. Pearl Jam keeps growing and you know, the people like Nirvana and Red Hot Chili Peppers that they were working with, they keep growing. Once the bands get to a certain size, Golden Voice just can't support them anymore and they don't have the tools to, to book the kind of shows that these bands need. After a while of punk and alt rock getting more mainstream, they start looking towards another kind of community that they can help find spaces for. They turn to techno and electronic and they start getting really into that. In the early 90s, electronic and techno was extremely looked down upon as well. They would often get raided by cops because there was a lot of drug use. People just overlooked completely like the, the music side of these shows and just thought about the raving aspect. It just, it had a lot of bad connotations with it, which is crazy to think about now. They started helping them yeah, have shows. Eventually, Golden Voice starts dipping their toes into the festival world. Oh, back then, America didn't really do a lot of festivals, and when they did, it was a single genre. And so Golden Voice decides to start throwing an electronic festival called Organic that happens in the mountains. It was so beautiful. You should look up some videos. Right after they start throwing Organic, Paul Tolette goes to Glastonbury in the UK. And if you don't know what Glastonbury is, it's probably one of the biggest music festivals in the entire world. It's so iconic. It takes place in the UK and they always just have insane acts. It's, I think, almost like a week long. When Paul Tolette comes back, he was like, Oh my God, why do we have nothing like this in America? I really want to put on a multi-genre festival, bringing together all these different acts, having people come together and having it on a much more massive scale than what we've seen before in America. They start ideating on what this festival will be and they decide to start Coachella in 1999 on that same polo field that they threw the Pearl Jam concert on six years prior. They start telling everybody about their idea and they're getting really amped up about it, but everybody said the same thing. 
Americans don't know how to do festivals. Never really been a part of our culture. Americans get too rowdy, they can't handle their alcohol and drugs, and they just don't understand it. Still, they kept persisting because they were like, we, we can do this, like, we can make this happen. And a week before their ticket sales went up, Woodstock 99 happened. And if you don't know what Woodstock 99 is, I recommend you watch the Netflix documentary on it. I personally almost could not finish it because so many horrific things happened at that festival. It was just kind of what these people were talking about in that it was a lot of Americans together at this festival who got too crazy and didn't understand the kind of like respectful gathering that you expect from festivals. So that happened and a week later, Coachella's tickets go on sale. Meanwhile, the insurance for Coachella goes up 40% because of Woodstock and California is trying to pull all of their permits from them. Somehow they still manage to put on Coachella and they get 40,000 people to come out for a two day festival. Coachella across the board, since it started has had killer acts and you have to credit this to how much people loved Golden Voice. Golden Voice was such a darling in the music community that every artist was down to just like come out and be a part of this. And so the very first Coachella had like Morrissey, Rage Against the Machine, Beck, so many incredible acts. There were 40 total over this two day span. It looked like an immediate success. People had an incredible time. Everything went off without a hitch for the most part. But afterwards, they were looking at their finances and they were like, we just lost so much money. So much more than they had predicted at their worst calculation. They have to go back to a lot of these acts and they're like, hi, Rage Against the Machine. We actually can't pay you what we said we would. Thing is, these bands loved Golden Voice so much that all of them were like, sure, that's fine. Pay me when you can, if you can and we'll see, which I love. I love that so much. Oh, also, I almost forgot to mention that the founders of Lollapalooza also came in and helped them out financially during this time, which is so cool because Lollapalooza could have seen them as a competitor, but instead they were like, please, please try and succeed. Just after this, a lifeline comes through. They don't think that they'll ever put on a Coachella again, and AEG ends up acquiring Golden Voice in 2001, and they're sitting down talking about all of the initiatives with helping AEG plan shows and, and book people and promote artists. AEG looks at them and they say, we want you guys to do another Coachella. And Rick and Paul were like, are they serious? Okay, sure. And they start planning the next Coachella. So obviously they didn't throw one in 2000, but then the next one takes place in 2001. The headliner that year was uh, Jane's Addiction who had done this crazy last performance and they were fully retired and they only came back from Golden Voice's request that they would please headline Coachella 2001 and they came back gladly and put on a killer show. And they keep putting on Coachellas with crazy lineups. I mean, we're talking Bjork, Radiohead, The Pixies, Oasis, um, Iggy Pop, Beastie Boys, everybody you can think of that was like iconic. And when 2002 comes around, they like almost kind of break even. And then in 2004, they finally turn a profit. And until 2004, every time they put on a Coachella, they were like, this is probably the last one we're doing. Even though that up until 2004 is basically their origin story, I think it's important to explore what they've done from 2004 until present to keep them as this cultural darling of America. The thing is that they're always iterating, they're always improving. And so Coachella today looks so different than Coachella five years ago. Part of this is, you know, they add new stages all of the time, depending on what they think could be improved at Coachella, whether it be a new stage for up and coming artists or one tent that is designed to feel like you're in an intimate music venue. Also, it's said that in the early 2000s, they really helped the burgeoning indie rock scene that was coming up. It's also said that in 2006, the Daft Punk performance at Coachella was one of the birthing moments of EDM. It was that iconic of a performance. And they've just continued to get more and more genre -less every single year. Obviously, this started as a festival for punk music, hip hop, and techno. But as time has gone on, they've gone less of, of staying in those realms to just being everything that is kind of 
topically relevant in American mass culture at the moment. They're a mirror to what's going on musically and they've got their, their hand on the pulse of, like I said, everything in American pop culture, whether it be the very small bands that are up and coming to the more mass ones that we all know about. Some other things that they did in 2011, they wanted more people to experience Coachella and so they started live streaming it, which is an amazing feature to provide people. In 2012, they wanted even more people to experience Coachella who wanted to actually physically be there. So in 2012 they added that second weekend and now you know they were kind of the first festival to do two separate festival weekends with the exact same lineup. And they just keep pushing the boundaries of live performance. I know we all remember that 2012 hologram show of Tupac. That was something everybody was talking about for like the entire next year. You can kind of Talk to anyone and whether Coachella is their favorite music festival or not, it's undeniable that Coachella really puts on a, an impeccable festival. Everyone you talk to just raves like I just did about the stage production and the easiness of getting around the festival and experiencing it. And I mean, the, the screens and the lighting, it, it makes you feel all, whether you're crazy far back or crazy close up, everybody's kind of in this like collective movement because of all of the work that they've put into the production. And you can also see that throughout time, Artists really give their all for this performance, besides Frank Ocean. It's this big moment for them. They want to put on this show that they know is going to last in history forever. During all of my research, I was just looking up like all of the performances of past Coachellas, and I didn't realize how many people have... Basically, if you look up anybody who's like a classic figure in our pop culture, they have performed at Coachella. I mean, everyone across the board. It's insane, and there's so many wild performances that, like I said, I recommend going down a rabbit hole of just Coachella performances throughout time. While they obviously took, you know, a few years to make money and then a few years to become actually profitable, Coachella is quite profitable these days. They make a lot of money. In 2017, the festival had about 250,000 attendees and they grossed about $115 million. Just thinking about how it goes back all the way to that 1993 concert Pearl Jam threw in that same field. And that was like the spark that ignited everything that Coachella became. They deserve to be millionaires. They put in 20 years of work with no money until they finally came up with Coachella. And even to this day, like I said, with all of the iterations, it's not like they just made it and left it. They are continuing to just make it better and better. So why did Coachella succeed? And, and why did they become what they are today? I think a lot of it comes down to, obviously blood, sweat, and tears went into all of the, the stuff that they did with Golden Voice before Coachella. And you know, even once they started creating Coachella, these things aren't easy to pull off. Like I said, like in 2001, they forgot to buy trash cans. Like that is pretty, wild and a big rookie mistake to make at a music festival. Their vision and, and their pull towards this mission that really helped them succeed. That with good character, I mean, good character goes so far. I know I mentioned this in my last video, but so much of what they were able to pull off was from their connections in the music industry, from having all of those years of just being really good to the customer, to the, to the viewer of the shows, and really good to the bands. Everybody loved Golden Voice because they were just a solid company. So when it came to starting a festival and needing acts or not being able to pay acts or trying to figure out the next year's lineup, it was never, they didn't get met with a lot of friction. One thing that is just so important throughout your whole career is to just be nice to everybody. Doing good is good business. I've heard that before and it's so true. All of these positive interactions come back. This was the story of Coachella. I really hope you guys loved it. I love you. I love you so much. Thank you for turning into another video. It's just always so nice to, you know, have you back here. You know, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still refining my storytelling and how to make it better and better. And so if you ever have any founder stories or company stories that you really want to hear about, please let me know. Either message me on social media or comment below. I want to tell the stories that you want to hear. Thank you so much, guys, and I will talk to you later.